am I going to be on the whole time or is it mostly going to be Dawn showing and then me whenever I have a question? You're live, but. Okay. Oh, huh. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Carrie Mills from the Gordon JCC Tuesday Talk Program. Welcome uh, to today's talk. I'm really excited for our guest today. I, I, um, I actually stumbled upon what you're going to learn about today just by accident. I was so fascinated. I just went right down the rabbit hole and, and found, got all the information I need to present to you for today's program. That being said, before we even start, I just want to remind everybody um, at any point, if you'd like to, uh, to participate in chat, please just type things in as we're talking and, um, and uh, we will get to your questions, okay? So welcome to today's, today's Tuesday talk. And today we are gonna be speaking with the Seeing Eye organization. And um, today's guest is Don McC McC McGowan, correct? Did I pronounce it correctly? McGowan, yeah, right. He's a volunteer program coordinator for the Seeing Eye. But what fascinates me, what fascinated me and caught my eye about all of this was that the Nashville connection, it was basically birthed in Nashville, which I had no idea that the seeing eye dogs were birthed in Nashville. And um, so, uh, so actually, have you ever been uh, walking along Union Street in downtown Nashville in front of the Hotel Indigo and notice that there's a historical marker for the seeing eye? So if not, please stop and take a look next time you're there because 90 years ago, and I'm not sure what month, at that same spot, that same building, the first dog training school for the assistance of the blind was established in the country, downtown Nashville. And um, the person who established this school, Frank Morris, that's correct, right, Don? Other way around, Morris Frank. Oh, Morris Frank, oh my gosh. Okay, thank you, see, I stumble and fumble. Morris Frank, I have actually that thing where you reverse, what's that, what's that called? Dyslexia. You, Dyslexia, yeah. Okay, but you can it with numbers, but I have to be careful, yeah. I'm just gonna give people a little bit of a, just a little bio, and then I'm gonna let, give, it, oh, give it over to you so you could really go into it. But Frank Morris um, lost his eyesight at two different ages, one eye at the age of six when he rode a horse into a tree limb, and his other eye at the age of 16 in a boxing accident at school. He was the son of John P. and Jesse Frank, and his mother was also blind. And Morris, this is so interesting, he attended M uh, MBA, Montgomery Bell Academy, which is right here. I live right down the street on West End Avenue. And he also attended Vanderbilt University. And according to the 1931 city directory, both Morris and his parents lived at 3809 Richland Avenue. Oh my gosh, I used to live around the corner. Where their home used to sit is now the property of West End Synagogue. Um, the home currently there was built years later. The home currently there was built years later. Okay, so their home used to sit what is now West End Synagogue. I mean, our, our, our community people who are listening to this right now, that is insane connection. Um, and so Don's gonna take us through the history and, and all about Seeing Eye Dog, which is just an incredible organization. And, um, and, and we can get more into the history in Nashville because there's even more about Vanderbilt University and how this all started. But I'm gonna give it over to Don because he's the expert. I'm this just chatty carry and, uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna step aside. So welcome Don and take it away. Well, thank you, Gary. And you are a happy chatty carry. That's good. <laughs> That's a good, a good introduction. Well, my name is Don McGowan and I have the pleasure of being a volunteer at the Seeing Eye, currently located in Morristown, New Jersey. And that's in the, in the northern part of the state. It's about 35 miles from New York City, just to give you an idea where we are. And uh, indeed, we celebrated last year in 2019, we celebrated our 90th anniversary of an, an enterprise that was begun in Nashville. I'll talk about the seeing eye a bit. I'm going to step back into the history then for a minute and then go into what the seeing eye does. It's one of these places that you see a blind person walking with a guide dog or a seeing eye dog and you say, oh, isn't that nice? But there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that you have no way to appreciate until somebody like me comes along and kind of lays it out. And I think you will be surprised at the things that you hear. So the, the 
mission of the seeing eye, the, the simplistic description of what we do is we breed and we raise and we train dogs to become seeing eye dogs. And then we match these dogs with blind people. And that's a very careful process so that people get dogs that they're gonna be comfortable with and vice versa. And then we train the two together and we send them on their way. So that's the broad description of what we do. We breed, raise, and train dogs to become seeing eye dogs. But there's another whole way to interpret that. And that is that we want to give people who are blind independence and dignity to live their lives in the best possible ways that they can. And the thing that's so important to think of is that blind people are no different from any of the rest of us, except that they can't happen to see. Some of us don't have good hearing. Some of us have other kinds of disabilities. We're perfectly good people but we happen to not have proper hearing or whatever. Blind people happen to not be able to see, but they're equally smart as they were when they could see. They laugh, they cry, they enjoy life. They're sad about things. All, all facets of their lives are the same as any of ours, except that they can't see. And so for that, they deserve the dignity that we would accord anyone not, oh, look at the poor blind person, oh, isn't that so sad, but the dignity that we should accord any person that we know. Well, stepping back into history a bit, as Carrie said, all of this began in Nashville. There was a lady named Dorothy Harrison Eustace, and she would, we would call her today a bon vivant kind of a person. She traveled, she wrote for the Saturday Evening Post, kind of a, you know, a a lady that just got around and enjoyed life and enjoyed sharing with others. She visited in Switzerland and Germany, and she saw what she felt was the most amazing thing she'd ever seen. And that is a school where dogs, and in particular German shepherds, given where they were, were being trained to help World War I veterans who had been blinded during the course of the war. This was in about uh, 2026, 2027, in, in, excuse me, 2016, 17, 1916, 17, I got to get in the right century, 1916 or 17, shortly after the, after the end of World War I. So she wrote an article in the Saturday Evening Post, and it's an extensive article. You will receive from Carrie an email attachment with that article that you can then read at your leisure and appreciate what was going on. But she wrote the article and said how amazing this process is. And she detailed some of it, explained it. There are a couple of photographs that helped to illustrate what was going on. And the remarkable thing is that the things that she describes in the Saturday Evening Post article are similar to the things I'm going to tell you today, which is to say, it's 90 years later, but dogs are still dogs. The basic needs to help people who are blind are still very much the same as they were at that time. It is 90 years later, there's technology, there are techniques that are better, but the fundamentals have not changed much. Well, she wrote the article and the article was November 5th. I have it right here, November 5th, 1927. So that was seen, or I should say more appropriately read to, by Morris Frank, an insurance agent living in Nashville who was blind. As Kerry said, he wasn't born blind. It wasn't a, a, a disease kind of a thing, but he had two different situations. He was riding a horse, rode into a tree limb, lost vision in one eye, was boxing later on, 10 years later, and got punched, and I don't know exactly what happened, but he lost vision in the other eye, so he became blind. He was an insurance agent. He continued to work, but with the assistance of someone who would guide him and lead him and keep him safe and help him to get around. This article by Dorothy Harrison Eustace was read to him, and he said, oh boy, this is something I have to find out about. He wrote a letter 
to Dorothy Harrison Eustace, you will see too a copy of the letter that he wrote in the stilted, somewhat stilted language of the time, not like we would write a letter today, but nevertheless, he wrote a letter to Dorothy Harrison Eustace thanking her for sharing all the information she had learned about the Seeing Eye School in Germany and offered that if she would come here, he would like to start something in the United States along the same lines. End of story. She agreed, he agreed, they made it happen. He lived in Nashville, so they started in Nashville in the location that Gary described, right on Union Street in downtown Nashville. They started in Nashville. They organized with just a few people beginning to train and Morris Frank ended up with the first seeing eye dog in the United States, a dog that was named Buddy. The funny thing is that the original, the dog's original name was Kiss. Well, he said, I don't think I like that name because can you see me walking around town saying, here kiss, come kiss, bad dog kiss. And that just would not go over too well. So he named his dog Buddy. And then in the course of his lifetime, he had, I don't know, eight or nine dogs. They don't obviously don't live as long as we do. So people who have seeing eye dogs, you know, commonly exchange one for another and another uh, as long as they're able to work. Every dog that the seeing eye, every dog that Morris Frank had was named Buddy. Whether they were boys, whether they were girls, it didn't matter. They were all Buddy. And Buddy is an honorary name now, not given out at the seeing eye. It's uh, Morris Frank's honorary name. Kind of like Derek Jeter's number being hung up in Yankee Stadium. <laughs> so is Buddy, a reserved name that nobody, no other dog gets. So they started out in Nashville and, and they worked in Nashville for just a few years. Uh, a couple of things happened. The reason they were attracted to Nashville originally was not only did Morris Frank live there, but they wanted to go to a place where public services, transportation, restaurants, hotels, and so forth would be receptive to dogs, to guide dogs, being with a person. And keeping in mind that this was 1919, that area, this was not a common thing to do. Uh, but Na Nashville was accommodating. They would be fine with dogs, guide dogs, coming on streetcars, subways, trains, hotels, restaurants, and that obviously was important. They stayed in Nashville for just a few years. And, and one of the problems there was it was too warm for too much of the year. And they said, we need to go someplace where the climate is a little cooler and where it's more comfortable walking, working with training the dogs and training the people to use the dogs. And so Dorothy Harrison Eustace made some property available in New Jersey in a town called Whippany, New Jersey. And they went there in 1921 and stayed there until 1965 where the seeing eye was able to move to an even bigger, more suitable place in Morris Township, New Jersey, which again, not far away from Whippany in Northern Central New Jersey. And that's where the seeing eye is to, the, to this day. A beautiful place, um, beautiful lush forestry and trees around and nice buildings, a very nice facility for people to come and receive dogs for us to train dogs and do all the things we do. So from, from Nashville to Whippany, New Jersey, to Morristown, New Jersey, and that's what it's been for 90 years. All began in Nashville, and we regard that, and the article that you'll also get says, that Morris Frank, to his dying day, regarded Nashville as the home of the seeing eye, even though most of its time was in Morristown. Okay, so that's background. Interesting and coincidental and good that Carrie stumbled across it because it gave us the hook to be able to talk to you today. So what do we do at the seeing eye? 
Well, as I said earlier, we breed, we raise, and we train dogs to become seeing eye dogs. Then we match them with people who are, who are visually impaired so that they will work well together and we train the pair together. We breed the dogs. We breed our own dogs. So if someone comes to us and says, oh, I have a beautiful dog, I'd like to give him to you to be a seeing eye dog, we will say thank you, but no thank you. We need to breed our dogs. And the reason for that is that over time, we need to know the lineage of each dog that we breed, that we raise. And that is, what, who were the dog's parents? What was their health? How did they do in training? What was their disposition? What's their personality? Are they good dogs to be seeing eye dogs? Do they, do they display the attributes that we need in dogs to guide a person who's blind? And there are many of those attributes. But we want to breed our own dogs. We breed somewhere in the vicinity of 400 dogs each year. And we place almost 300 dogs a year to about 24 students each month that come to the seeing eye. We breed 400 dogs, about 290, 300 are placed. Those that are not placed for whatever reason, ranging from health to disposition to whatever it might be, are found good homes, good places to live, uh, and they become good dogs, good pets for people, even though they don't succeed as seeing eye dogs. The kinds of dogs we breed are principally three. German Shepherds, hearkening back to the old days in Germany, Labrador Retrievers, and Golden Retrievers. We also cross Labs, labs and golden retrievers to produce what many of the trainers think is the best dogs of all. Uh, they have the qualities of both dogs. They're good, they're big, they're sturdy, they're strong, they're smart, they have good vision, they have good hearing. And most importantly, these three breeds of dogs like to please. They like to please, and that's an important quality in them. Because you think about the work that a guide dog is going to do. A blind person is going to say, come on, Fido, come on, Dudu, whatever your name is. Come on, let's go. Let's go. And we want that dog to say, yeah, I want to go. I want to get out there. My, my, my owner wants me to go and do my job, and I want to do that. And these three dogs, like these three breeds of dogs, like to do that. Now, I contrast this by saying when my kids were younger, years ago, we had a Shetland sheepdog, a Sheltie, a really beautiful dog, a cute dog, a lovable dog. But that dog's instinct was to herd. And when we would let this dog out in the backyard, a fenced in backyard, all that dog would do was to run around and around and around the yard. That dog was following its instincts and herding. There was nothing to herd, but she was herding. Would that dog be a good seeing eye dog? I don't think so. <laughs> its instincts would be entirely wrong. Other dogs want to dig in every hole they can find. They want to dig up a, a rat or whatever they might be there. You know, anything that they smell or sniff or see, they will want to dig and they will want to dig. Is that going to be a good seeing eye dog? I don't think so. We want a dog that has the disposition, that says I can learn what my job is. I can please my owner and go about my business without being distracted by other things. And the German Shepherds, Golden Retrievers, and Labrador Retrievers all fall into that category. They're friendly dogs. They're dogs that love to be with people. People love them, even though some of the stereotype of a German Shepherd is of a dog that's mean, nasty, the junkyard dog, the guard dog. But if a, if a German Shepherd is raised in a loving environment, it's the most beautiful dog you could ever ask for. Obedient, attentive, takes care of its owner, all the qualities that we want. So we breed our own dogs. 
to know their lineage, to know their background, to know their health, to know their history. And because we know that they are dogs that like to please, they like to do their jobs. So of the 400 dogs that we breed each year, every dog, assuming that health is okay and assuming that everything looks right, every dog goes out to be raised by what we call a puppy raiser or a puppy raising family. So from about the time they're eight weeks old and we're sure they're viable and going to survive, we send each dog out to live with a family who will raise that dog for 14 or 15 months during the period that we call puppy raising. And this is an important time. The dogs aren't being trained to be seeing eye dogs at this point. They're being trained to be good dogs in the home, to be calm, to be gentle, to not jump all over people, to not bark at everything that happens, preferably to not be up on furniture, uh, to be good dogs in the home. The puppy raisers are trained themselves in how to raise these dogs, to not encourage them to be on the furniture, to not encourage them to bark, to discourage them from jumping up, to discourage them from behaviors that would not be very becoming for a seeing eye dog to exhibit. They do everything they can with the dogs. They take them out, they play with them, they go to families, they go to picnics, they go to parties, they go in cars, they go in trains, they go in planes, any place that it's reasonable to take these dogs as they're growing up, the puppy raisers take them. We have a network of something like 500 families in New Jersey, Northern Delaware, Eastern Pennsylvania, who are puppy raisers. And this is the most amazing group of people. They love what they do. These are people who most of us, if we pull out of our wallet, we would show you pictures of our grandchildren. Well, these people show you pictures of their puppies. And they say, this is Bobo, and this is Susie, and this is whoever. And they love their puppies. And, you know, and they just, that's, for many people, that's really their calling in life, their identity. They love to do this. They're proud to do it. And we're just proud to have them with us because the work that they do is priceless. We could not afford to pay people to do this. People do this voluntarily for a small stipend to cover the cost of food and we take care of their medical bills and so forth. But people love to raise these puppies and they do a great job. So people have these dogs for 14 or 15 months. And during that time, the puppy raisers hook up with a puppy raising club. We sponsor puppy raising clubs, kind of like one in many counties in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. There are several of them in Morris County adjacent to the seeing eye just because it's close by. And in those puppy raising clubs, groups of people come together and they bond socially as you might expect. And they'll go together with all of their dogs and they'll do Get, they play games with them. They have scavenger hunts and follow the leader and all kinds of things to expose the dogs to groups of people, to expose the dogs to other dogs, to just do all kinds of things to help further their growth and development as they're growing up and becoming potentially, hopefully, likely, seeing eye dogs. The leaders of the puppy clubs become pretty adept at pointing out, and they might say, you know, your dog needs a little bit of help in this area or that area. I see something to be concerned about. I suggest that you try this, try that to help break them of what might be a bad habit. So the puppy raisers work with their puppy clubs and their puppy leaders to raise dogs uh, for 14 or 15 months to the point where they're ready to go back to the seeing eye. So here's the very sad place now where the seeing eye says to this puppy raiser, and generally these are families with young children who are all learning about this. We go back to the puppy raising families and saying, okay, it's time for the dog to come back to the seeing eye. And that's a sad day. A lot of people say, well, I'd love to be a puppy raiser, but I could never give that dog back. And that's understandable because dogs have their way of working their way into our hearts as we all know. But people do that. 
and they learn to part with the dogs. There's a lady I know that exemplified this best who said, well, on Tuesday, I cried. On Wednesday, I took my dog back to the seeing eye. And on Thursday, I got a new puppy. Mm -hmm. So there are people who have raised, believe it or not, 20, 30, 40 puppies over the course of a lifetime. They pass this on to their children. So there are puppy raising families. It's just an amazing institution. And as I say, we could not do what we do without them. So the dogs come back to the seeing eye. And now it's time to start training them to be seeing eye dogs. There's medical checks. There's all kinds of things being done here to be sure that the dogs are well suited. Personality, growth development, medical history, all of that. And assuming that all is well, we now begin to train them to be seeing eye dogs. So what does that entail? So this is where the part things get very interesting. The first thing we do is to have the dogs become used to wearing a harness. And this is a seeing eye harness. This is a real one. It's made out of leather. It's got metal in the handle. So there's a firm connection. The dog's head goes through here. His legs go through here. And there's a strap that goes around his belly that holds the whole thing together. And then the person who's blind holds the handle in their left hand and lets the dog guide them as they learn how to do this. So the first thing that the trainers do is to have the dog become accustomed to wearing a harness. And this is simply a matter of having a harness. They have harnesses that don't have handles. They put the harness on the dog just for the dog to get used to this. And this is very important because we, we say that the, what this becomes like is when I used to go to work and I'd put on my tie or when a policeman is gonna go out on duty and puts on his uniform, that signifies that I'm going to work. The policeman's doing his job, the fireman, whatever it is. The seeing eye dog learns that when that harness goes on, that means we're in seeing eye dog mode. We're here for business now, we're not playing. When he's got his harness on, he's learning that he's supposed to be disciplined, doing the things that he's trained to do. So that's the first thing that happens, just simply getting the dog accustomed to wearing a harness. And then after that, the next thing that comes along is the trainers will work with a seeing eye dog to simply walk down a path or walk down a sidewalk for the dog to get used to having a person holding on to the harness and being led. Now, there's a couple of little interesting things here. When I talk about what qualities we're looking for in a dog, one is that the dog wants to lead. When we have our own pets, we often will teach a dog to heal, which means to walk right beside me, walk right where I know where you are. That's not what we want in a seeing eye dog. We want a dog to pull. We want a dog to be willing to lead me. Now, some dogs, like some people, are just timid. And in their nature, they say, well, I'm a little bit shy about, about leading, about taking the lead. I'd rather be guided. If a dog has that personality, he will not become a seeing eye dog. Might be a wonderful pet, but not a good seeing eye dog because the dog needs to have the confidence to lead and know that this person is holding the harness and being guided by him or her. The dog needs to have that quality. So the trainer works with the dog. And this is the beginning of what is about a four month training period. And what happens is that we have teams of trainers and each trainer is given, they term it a string, a string of maybe four, maybe five dogs to train. And what they'll do is work with a dog in, in some aspect, whatever they're doing today, like walking down the sidewalk or walking down the path. Now dogs don't have long attention spans. Dogs work for half an hour or something like that. And then, you know, they're kind of done. 
And so the trainer, any given trainer with the four or five dogs that they have will take their first dog up and down the sidewalk, up and down the path for half an hour or so, then back and then get the next dog and up and down the sidewalk in the path and the next dog and so forth. So dogs are being, trainers are working with four or five dogs. The dogs are taking turns in learning whatever the task is for the day. So they start out learning simply to walk down a sidewalk, down a pathway, nothing about obstacles, nothing about traffic, nothing about anything, but simply being coming comfortable guiding a person down that pathway. Well, the next thing that comes along is for us to start taking the dogs into Morristown. And we're located just a couple of miles away from downtown Morristown. And that's our training class. That's where everything happens. And we start out with the dogs now early in training in the back streets of Morristown where there's very little traffic, there's sidewalks, and we're walking down the sidewalk. And now we want to introduce to the dog that they need to stop at a curb, stop at an intersection. Why? Obviously. So you're not going to walk out in front of traffic, but also so that the person, the blind person, will know that there's we're stopping for a reason, and it's probably a curb. And so the dog will stop, and even the trainers, even though they're sighted, will step out with their toes and feel the curb, and then they will praise the dog. And remember, I said that these dogs like to be pleased. This is what it's all about. I, the dog has stopped. First of all, I'm stopping him at the curb so that he gets the idea. I praise him, praise him. Good dog, scratch his ears, whatever it is. And we walk on ahead and we go to the next curb and I stop him and I praise him and I praise, praise, praise. And the dogs figure this out. And in the space of a day, day and a half, maybe two days, the trainer and the dog are walking down the sidewalk, come to the curb. And what happens? The dog stops. The dog has figured out that if he stops when he comes to a curb, he's going to get praised. And he likes that, as we all do. We all like being praised when we've done something and somebody says, thank you. And that's, a, in a sense, what this is all about. So they worked through this whole drill for a day, day and a half, two days, to learn to stop at intersections. Important lesson learned. Next thing is about obstacles, about things in the middle of the sidewalk, about garbage cans, about trees, about fire hydrants, about even other people who are walking on the sidewalk. And the dog needs to learn how to take me carefully through these things. Because until the dog learns differently, we can walk up to, let's say, a garbage can that's found its way into the middle of a sidewalk, which happens where I live sometimes, probably where you live too. And until the dog learns differently, he will walk right by the garbage can and I could walk right into it. And he's not attuned to the fact that he needs to allow space for me. So we guide the dogs again. We'll stop when we come to this garbage can, the trainer will stop him and have him lead around the garbage can, leaving space for me to keep me safe. And I praise him and we do it again. And I praise him and we do it again. And we go to the next thing and the next thing where the dog is learning to avoid obstacles, to keep me safe, to allow room so that I don't walk in or get hurt or trip over whatever is there and keep me safe. Always praising, always praising. That's the way we train the dog with repetition and reinforcement. We never roll up a newspaper and swat them in the rear end. That's not part of it at all. It's positive reinforcement. So now we've learned to stop at intersections the dog has learned to help me avoid obstacles. Another form of obstacles is overhead. And this is an interesting one because dogs really, you know, in the world in which we all live, dogs don't think too much about what's overhead. But I'm six feet tall 
and a dog could be guiding me to a restaurant with an awning, a low hanging awning or a tree with branches hanging down or something of the sort, an umbrella, whatever it is. And he could, he could, I could get hit in the head. And imagine being blind. Imagine walking with your dog and suddenly getting hit in the head with something. It would be the most terrifying thing that could happen. So we teach the dogs in the same way to learn to look up. And we teach them by going to places we know where there is a low hanging umbrella or awning or tree or something. And we'll come up to that and I'll grab it and I'll shake it and I'll bang on it and draw the dog's attention to that. And then we walk around it. And I'll do that again and again and again so that he learns to look up and think about what's overhead so, so that he's keeping me safe. That's his job is to keep me safe. And he'll walk around an overhead obstacle just as he would if it was that garbage can on the ground. And so we go. We teach the dogs about going up and down stairs. Now, here's an interesting thing. We come to a flight of stairs and the dog will stop. He's being taught over time to stop when there's anything that he needs to call the blind person's attention to. And the person will reach out with their toe, with their foot and say, okay, okay, I get it. Here's the bottom step. I need to step up. And if possible, the dog will guide them, nudge them a little bit to help them find a handrail if there is that. And he will take the dog, the person up the step one at a time. Now, those that have dogs know that most dogs, when they come to a flight of stairs, they just go boom, up that flight of stairs or wham, down that flight of stairs. That's what they do. Not what you want to do with a person who's blind. Instead, we teach the dogs to go up the stairs step by step by step at a very measured pace so that the blind person can be safe on those stairs with the dog leading them up the stairs one careful step at a time. Same way going down. Any blind person will tell you that the most terrifying place to be is at the top of a flight of stairs. None of us wants to fall down a flight of stairs, obviously, and a blind person even more so because they can't see what's there. They don't know what they're, what they're dealing with. So the dogs help them by being very careful, giving them a stop at the top of the stairs. Okay, there's stairs here. I feel it with my foot. I look for a handrail and then I go down the stairs one step at a time. So we teach the dogs about stairs, about ramps, about escalators. We have an escalator at the seeing eye, which really doesn't go anyplace useful, but it's an escalator and it acquaints the dogs with what that's all about. And imagine being a dog and you've learned, learned about stairs and you say, okay, uh, stairs are fine. And then suddenly you've got these stairs that move. It's a whole nother thing for the dog to understand and be comfortable with. Plus the fact that they give off this low rumble sound that could be a little bit intimidating to a dog. We teach them about stairs. We teach the, the dogs and the blind people later on about revolving doors where they have to use those. They try to avoid those whenever they can because dogs are liable to get their tails caught in the revolving door. Not a good thing. But, they, but we teach it during the course of training. We teach the dogs and let them experience everything that they're likely to experience when they're with a blind person. During training, we take them into New York City. We want to find out how the dog reacts there. And dogs are like people. Some dogs will love to be in the city. They like the noise. They like the excitement. They like the commotion, the people, all of that. Other dogs don't like to be in the city. They're timid. They're afraid of all the noise, all the congestion. And that's something we have to know. So we learn, we take the dogs to the city to find out. We take them to Newark Airport to have them be exposed to a big wide expanse as most concourses are in airports where there isn't a sidewalk, where there isn't a structure. And we give them the experience of being in a place like that. Now from a blind person's standpoint, generally in some place like an airport, 
an attendant will probably see them and come and offer, can I help you to get to gate so-and-so or, or whatever it is you're trying to do. But we want the dogs to experience that. We take them into stores. We take them into grocery stores, into shopping stores. We take them into all the places, as I say, that a person who's blind might eventually take the dogs so that they've had that experience before they're ever assigned to a blind person. So we do all of that. It lasts, as I say, about four months. And then the dogs are pretty well ready to go. They've been through traffic. They've been through obstacles. They've been through all of this. One thing left that I didn't talk about, and this is as important as anything, and that is something we call intelligent disobedience. Now, when we come to an intersection, if I'm a blind person coming to an intersection and my dog has stopped me at the curb and I want to cross the street, how do I decide when it's time to cross the street? Who makes that decision? And if I could see all of you and you'd be saying the dog does or you'd be, I don't know what you'd be saying. The answer is the blind person makes the decision by listening, by listening. So if I'm a blind person and we've come to an intersection, I'm going to listen to traffic. And if I hear traffic going back and forth in front of me, I probably don't want to go. I surely don't want to go. But if I hear traffic going in the same direction as I'm going, then it may be safe. And I'll say to my dog, forward, forward, which is the command we give to say, let's go. Well, during training, we teach the dogs, I'll explain in a minute, we teach the dogs that if they see something that they recognize as not being safe, they won't obey the command. They will take control and they will pull a person back saying, no, it's not safe. There's a car coming or bicycle coming or construction tape is in front of you that wasn't there yesterday or whatever it might be. And we do that, we train the dogs by pairs of trainers working with the dog, one at the curb, the other driving happens to be a Prius that we have that's a quiet, it's a silent car. And the person will say to the dog, forward, let's go. The person in the car will drive out right in front of them. And we, and we pull back the dog and we say, no, 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 that's not the right thing to do. Because up until this point, a car is a friendly thing to a dog. They jump in the car, they go for a ride, they're going someplace, they're, you know, whatever's happening. A car is a friendly thing. The dog needs to learn that a car is not something that you mess with. A car is not something that you should walk out in front of. It's not a friendly thing when it's on the road and you're on the street. Or similarly, if people who are blind are at a train station with an elevated, um, uh, walkway, or if they're in the New York City subways where there's a drop off down to the tracks, the dogs need to learn if I should become disoriented and say, let's go forward to walk off the edge of a platform or the tracks, the dog will say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And of course, the dog is looking and saying, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go down into these tracks. But he's also, though, pulling the person back and keeping him safe. That's intelligent disobedience. And it may be the most important thing that the dogs learn. Well, okay, now we've trained our dogs and now we wanna match them up with people. And what happens is that people are calling the seeing eye or reaching out to the seeing eye who are blind or someone in the family's blind, calling and saying, what do we do? I have somebody, I'm blind or my, somebody's blind in my family. What do we do? And we talk to them and there are forms to fill out and all the things you might expect. But then before we get any further involved, a trainer will go and visit that person. Whether that person lives a town away, whether that person lives in Nashville, California, whatever it is, we go and visit that person. Because we wanna see how they live, where they live, what they do all day, who they live with, what the requirements of their lives are. Are they in a city? Are they in a suburban area? Are they in a farm? Where are they? 
and we go and we make that visit. And then the trainer says, okay, now I'm getting some clues. Also, the trainer takes um, a, a dummy kind of a harness and takes the blind person who wants to receive a dog for what we call a Juno walk. And that is, I, the trainer, will take you, the blind person, holding a harness for a walk for a quarter of a mile, half a mile, a good distance, because I want to get a feel for whether you show signs that you can trust me and how fast you like to walk. Everybody walks at a different pace. Some people walk very fast. Some people are older, a little bit timid. Maybe they don't have a good sense of balance, whatever it is. They need to go more slowly. I need to know that. I need to know where you live, how you live, and what your walking speed is. Then we come back to the seeing eye and say, okay, we're going to have a class of 24 people come in. We've got a bunch of dogs that we've trained, and they're all good dogs. They're all different. And I'm going to say, this person that I visited is a, is a guy, maybe he's a veteran out of the, maybe he's a Marine that lost his vision, but he's a big, strong guy that can walk fast. He's, you know, powerful, tough guy. That, that guy needs the best, fastest, toughest German shepherd we can find. And maybe I've visited someone who's elderly, who's a little bit unsteady on their feet, who doesn't have such demands. And I'm going to say, I think the right dog for that person would be a small, quiet, golden retriever who's a lovable dog, not going to pull so hard, not going to expect to walk so fast. So their walking temperament matches, their walking pace matches, as well as the dog that's comfortable in the city or suburbia or, or whatever it is. So we figure out, we look at all of these things and say, okay, I think this dog is for that person, this dog is for that person, this dog is for that person, for 24 people. And then 24 people come in to the seeing eye. And of course, this is during normal times. <laughs> now is not normal times. But uh, on normal times, 24 people come in and they spend their first day or two learning a bit about their dogs, about the care, about the whole drill at the seeing eye. They're learning what the seeing eye's physical location is like. They're feeling maps, topographical maps of the place, so they know how to get around. But then on about the third day, we match each person up with a dog. And this is after we have thought about this and said, I think, this is the best dog we have for you, matches you in all these ways we can think of. And I give you the dog and immediately you start to bond with that dog. And bonding means loving the dog, giving the dog attention, beginning to hold and caress and care for and pat and stroke and, you know, scratch his ears and all that kind of thing. And the dog becomes the blind person's roommate. We have a wing in our building, which is essentially a hotel, or we call it the dormitory wing, where there's 24 rooms, each with a private bath, each with a bed and dresser and all the things. People come and they stay for nearly a month at the seeing eye, and they're given their roommate right away, their dog. And so they, they, they immediately start to bond with one another, start to connect with one another. Now, people say, isn't this difficult for the dog? Think about it. They've gone from the breeding station where they were with people there. They've gone from their family that raised them for 14 or 15 months. They've gone with their trainer who they've become attached to for four months. And now, once again, the dog is being passed off to another person who will be their, hopefully, longtime partner. And... The way to think of this is that dogs pretty much live in the moment. They don't think too much about the future. They barely know there's a future. They don't think too much about the past. Their concerns are, am I being well cared for? Am I being loved? Am I being fed? Do I have a place to live, a place to sleep, a place to eat? Am I being fed? All those things. And if those requirements are being met, the dog is pretty much going to say, okay, this is a good thing. 
and they will receive their new owners very readily as long as all of the vibrations are right. You know, the feelings are right and the sensibilities between them are right. Similarly, the person has to adjust to the dog. And so there's a, an interesting connection taking place here, almost like an arranged marriage, but we've done everything we can think of at the seeing eye to say, we believe that this is gonna work. And so the, the pair now, the blind person and their dog, go back out to the streets of Morristown, where the dog has been working for four months and more past that, and they're learning the same things. They're learning to walk together. They're learning to stop at curbs. They're learning to listen for traffic, learning to deal with obstacles, all the things that the dog has already been trained, but now the dog and his new owner have to learn. Now, many people are, who are coming in for classes have had dogs before, so they don't need to necessarily know everything from scratch, but a dog is a unique personality, just like each person is a unique personality. So it's not one size fits all remotely. So even though I've had a dog or two or three or four before, this dog is a different dog than any of the others and that dog and I need to bond. We need to become familiar with one another. We need to learn to work together well. And, and that's what we spend nearly, nearly a month doing. And so they go through that process and eventually you come out at the other end and say, okay, this has been a success. Does every dog and every blind person work? Does every match work? No, occasionally they don't. But we have, as I say, more dogs than we have need for. And so another dog will come into the picture quickly. When it's not going to work, it's pretty much like two people. You know, we've probably all met somebody who we immediately know that we like. And we've all met somebody who we immediately aren't so comfortable with. And it's the same way with people and dogs you'll know almost immediately if this isn't going to work and we'll bring in another dog and presumably that's going to be more successful and generally it is. Very rarely does a person go through the entire training with their dog, go home and decide it's not going to work. That very rarely happens. So it's a, it's a good success rate and people come away very happy. Dawn, um, so I don't, I'm, I don't even want to interrupt because I'm like this whole story. This it's so fascinating to me what you're you, you're sharing. Um, but I'm trying to keep track of time, and we only really have a few minutes to wrap up. So I didn't know, you know, maybe like five minutes at best. So where you would want to take this, or if we, I don't see any questions. If there are any questions to our in our audience, please write them out now. But um, otherwise, I just wanted to kind of wrap up today. I mean, I feel like, oh my gosh. This just, I, I have probably an explosion of questions to ask, but <laughs> it's so fascinating to me. So um, yeah, so if you want, want to just kind of wrap this up and, and, and um, we'll send out information to all our listeners and if any, li for, okay, so let's just share some information. Like, so if anybody would like the handouts that are beyond my usual email, just reach out to me at Carrie at NashvilleJCC.org and I will be happy to share. So it's C-A-R-R-I-E at NashvilleJCC.org. And um, if you want to just share, Don, any kind of places and reference for people to learn more, that would be really helpful too. Yeah, I've sent you before three attachments. I'll send them again. And I'm going to add one more. It's but, the article that you were looking at from, uh, from the website. Okay, uh, but also to share to our public, because this will go beyond our community, this, e this um, program. So if there are people out there who maybe are not getting the email, just even a, a place of reference that they could go to, you know, your site, your website or whatever. Yeah, well, I will tell, I will tell anyone, first of all, we have a website and the website is seeingeye.org, just like it sounds, seeingeye, one word, dot org. Or, or if you want to reach me, I would be happy to do this same kind of presentation for another group. And my email at the seeing eye is pennies, P-E-N-N-I-E-S, pennies at seeingeye.org. And I would welcome emails. 
to say, could you talk to my group? Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, school, whatever it might be, would be happy to do that. And the reason that it's called Pennies is that we have a program that we call Pennies for Puppies, where with in connection with our outreach, we raise funds for the seeing eye. We don't make all the money that supports the seeing eye, but we like to, we like to ask people if they would be willing to support. And if through the Pennies uh, email, if you'd like to do something, if you'd like to share, we would be very happy to hear from you. And as I say, happy to talk to you, happy to do this kind of a presentation for another group at any time. We're becoming Zoom experts. We'd rather do it in person, but Zoom is the horse we're riding right now. So that's what we'll do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to say one or two other things, and then we'll wrap up. And, and a question would be, how does one behave when you see a seeing eye, well, excuse me, when you see a blind person? How does one behave? Because many people just are completely uncomfortable. You're more likely to see someone with a cane because you're further away from any seeing eye or any training school. But the answer to that question with a cane, with a dog, would be to look at a person, expect that they are doing their best to be independent, and they might not need your help at all. You might say, if anything looks awkward, oh, can I help you? Can I offer you directions or anything that you need? And they may say, thank you, no, I'm fine, and that's good, or help them if they want. Don't ever grab a person by the arm. Anybody blind will tell you that startles them. It makes them unsure of what's going on. Speak to them as you would any other person. Good morning, I'm Don. Can I help you? You look like you might be, you know, disoriented or whatever you might say. If you see someone with a seeing eye dog, pay no attention to the dog. Hard as it is, the dogs are gorgeous. And they're just inviting, won't you come and pet me? Come and pet me. And we don't do that. You ignore the dog, talk to the person who's blind as if the dog isn't there. You know, what's your dog's name? How do you have, what, how long have you had your dog? All the obvious questions, but don't distract the dog because the dog is doing his job. A uh, person will be probably happy to tell you all about the dog and share with you, but will appreciate unless they give you permission will appreciate you're not making any attempt to pet or feed or do anything with the dog. These people are wonderful people. They have their independence, they have their pride, they have their dignity, and they wanna display that at all times. So help them in that way and they will appreciate it. That's really great to know. Um... I, I can't start with questions because we have to wrap up. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I was just, you know, enthralled uh, and mesmerized by just the whole process. Because um, how rarely do I, you know, I, I don't really ever really stop to think about what, what the actuality, you know, step by step is. So this has just been so informative. And um, your delivery was really, really, really easy to you know, just real, real, it was just great. That's all I could say. I, oh, thank you. I can't find the right words. And I'll say to you and yeah. Alex, since you're both um, New York girls, the next yeah. time you're in the vicinity, call cool. and you'll oh come and see God. the place. I would love that. Sure. So sure, thank sure. you for that. And I would love that. And I would love to be able to not have to quarantine and be able to actually be able to leave Tennessee. So I hope that'll happen sooner than later. That so, day is going to come. Yes, it is. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much. We'll be sending out information and please contact us, uh, all our listeners, for any information about today's program. And you can share it online. It will be on the Gordon JCC YouTube page. So feel free to share it on your social media pages and get the word out for such an incredible organization doing such amazing things. And um, thank you again, Don.